Mother Knows Death presents External Exams with Nicole and Jemmy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mother Knows Death on Mother Knows Death, Instagram, and the Gross Room. We always talk about autopsies on people, but we never talk about autopsies that are done on animals. On this week's external exam, we will be talking about animal pathology and forensics. An animal uh, autopsy is also called a necropsy, and they're performed by trained veterinarians who specialize in anatomic pathology. Today, we will be speaking with Dr. Allison Watson, who is a veterinary anatomic pathologist and assistant professor at Colorado State University Veterinarian Diagnostic Laboratories. Welcome, Dr. Watson. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much. Chat. Thanks so much for being here. Like I have a million questions for you, so we're going to get started. <laughs> um, before awesome. we start talking about your really, really cool and interesting job, let's first start talking how you got into the field of veterinary medicine. I think I'm uh, pretty similar to a lot of people that you asked that question. Uh, I, from a really young age, I loved animals, so I feel like that was kind of the first career that I had in mind as a, as a kid. So I always wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, and I also had uh, an aunt that I'm really close with who was a, a veterinary uh, tech technician. Uh, so that kind of inspired me to go that route as well. I feel like most students that I ask all say, oh, I've always wanted to be a vet uh, from you know, loving animals as, as kids. That's really cool. So did you get to go to work with your with your aunt when you were younger and see what she did every day? I did it a little bit. Um, my family always had animals. We always had dogs and cats that we brought and we brought them to the clinic that she worked at. Uh, but I didn't start doing any real shadowing or anything until I was in high school and actually kind of getting ready to, to graduate and go to college. All right. So I know how the field of medicine works, for example, just going to medical school. First, you have to go to college and you have to go to medical school. Then you have to do uh, residency fellowships and things like that. Is it the same for the field of veterinary medicine or how does it work? Like after you graduate high school, what do you do? It's pretty similar. Um, we go and uh, go and get a bachelor's degree first, uh, usually in some science field, just because it uh, fulfills all of the prerequisites for most veterinary schools. They all kind of have a little bit variation in, in prereqs, uh, prerequisites, but uh, like my uh, bachelor's is in biology and zoology. Uh, so kind of a, a basic science bachelor's degree. I had a few um, students in my class that didn't end up getting a full bachelor's degree. They got all the prereqs done and three years and then applied to vet school and were able to go. But I think there's maybe at least three in my class of 140 people. Uh, so after graduating with bachelor's degree, uh, then you apply to veterinary school. So same thing like medical school. And then it's another four years, um, four years of veterinary school with um, the clinical year being kind of the last year, year and a half where we're actually rotating through a large hospital and all the different specialties. And then uh, where it's a little bit different from human doctors is that at that time, uh, veterinarians can take the board exam. Uh, we take that in our last year. And then uh, you can go out and practice uh, in, uh, in clinics. So most of the time, the veterinarian that's going to see your pets, your dogs and cats or even horses, uh, is they're not specialized necessarily. So you can just go out and start practicing where uh, most or all human doctors do residency training after. Uh, it's not a requirement for veterinarians. Uh, but if you want to specialize, uh, become a pathologist or any of the other specialties, then uh, we apply again for internships usually. So one year rotating internship through, again, similar to our clinical year uh, where you rotate through all the different specialties in a large hospital and then go on to a three-year residency program. So uh, pathology is just a little bit different than that where we don't have to do 
the internship part, since we're not going to be practicing uh, clinical medicine on living patients, uh, we can just kind of go straight from veterinary school to residency. So that's what I did. At what point did you decide that you were interested in pathology as opposed to taking care of, and you do, you call them patients still? Uh, we do. <laughs> um, we often call them cases, uh, but I mean, they are patients. Yeah, of but, course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, yeah. So I, I started vet school uh, wanting to be a zoo vet. So uh, either work in a zoo or work in, in private practice with exotics pet birds and pet pet reptiles. I really like birds and reptiles. So uh, that's kind of what I started wanting to do. Um, when I was, uh, when you're working on applying to veterinary school, you have to get a lot of veterinary hours or volunteer animals with animals. Um, so, you know, volunteering at animal shelters or different rescue rehab places uh, and then vet clinics as well. So uh, when I was working on that, I uh, volunteered at the uh, Raptor, so Bird of Prey Rehab Center, uh, near where I went to college. And I was able to do necropsies there. So that's kind of my first exposure to what a necropsy was. And at that time, I still didn't know that that was a career that anyone did. Um, I thought it was just something that you did when animals die and other veterinarians do this too, but I didn't realize that there were veterinary pathologists until I started veterinary school. So uh, our first year of school, uh, we take kind of all the theology courses, so anatomy, physiology, um, virology, bacteriology, and then we also have our first pathology course. Uh, and that was kind of my first exposure to, wow, people do this as a career. Uh, and it really excited me in a way that clinical medicine didn't, which is kind of is kind of a scary feeling when I started vet school. Like, oh, I I've wanted this my whole life, but it's not really speaking to me as much as as I wanted it to uh, to be a zoo vet. But as soon as I started delving into what pathology was and what pathologists do for their job, it's kind of a light bulb going off my head like this is a perfect marriage of science and medicine for me so um i think by the time i was halfway through schools when i was 100 percent going oh i'm going to be a pathologist and kind of go down that route i love that story it sounds very similar to mine like i started mm -hmm. school to be a nurse and was like i this is definitely not for me right. and then i found pathology and was like okay this is I'm deaf. I, I could do, I could help people still and I could work in healthcare, mm -hmm. but not have to deal with the live yeah. people. <laughs> so <laughs> getting to that question, do, is there any ever a point that you see live patients anymore or, or are you only seeing parts of them or when they die? Uh, yeah, I pretty much don't see any live patients. Uh, our lab is connected to uh, the veterinary teaching hospital that um, so it has all of the, kind of, all the specialties housed in it. So if I needed to, I could go over there and look at the patient. Um, I do. So a particular interest of mine is, um, uh, dermatopathology. So pathology of the skin. Uh, so I do meet with, with our clinical dermatologists pretty frequently and at least see photos of their <laughs> living patients, <laughs> but uh, I don't usually meet them in person. That's awesome. Yeah, of course you want to see all that stuff cuz you're you're right. a pathologist, so it makes sense. Do you yeah. so in human medicine we have positions like mine which is a PA and we're the ones that dissect all the organs that come down from surgeries and we're also the ones that perform the eviscerations for the autopsies. Is there a similar position for someone like that in your field or is that something that you just handle completely yourself? It definitely depends on what lab you work in. Um, at our lab, we so we have three full-time necropsy technicians uh, that can help us if we want. Uh, so uh, I mentioned and you introduced me, I'm assistant professor. So we we teach veterinary students, so they're required to learn how to do necropsy as part of their training. So uh, we're teaching veterinary students uh, on our necropsy. Cropsy floor, 
So we often have them doing doing the actual exam to learn. Uh, but uh, if we're really busy or it's late in the afternoon or something, then my technicians can help or I'll have them do the full exam. Uh, and then as far as surgical specimens, we do have a whole separate team of technicians that do all of that, the gross exam on, on those specimens and uh, trimming into cassettes. And then I go up to our histology lab. That's interesting. So yeah. do, you, do you have a separate histology lab for for the vet medicine or do you just send them over to a medical one and they just cut them? Yeah, we have our own uh, right in-house uh, just down the hall from my office. So we have a we have I think we have like five or six full time techs in there and we do our own uh, immunohistochemistry and special staining as well. All in I'm really interested in this actually because what so if you want to do if you want to be a a veterinarian histotech if you just want to do animal specimens do you have to have the same or do you even know this do you have to have the same certifications as one that would work in a hospital you don't um they can uh but as far as I know, I don't think our technicians do, uh, but I have known a few at another place I worked and where I did residency that did that certification. Um, but uh, we, for some of our technicians, we just require a, a bachelor's degree in a science field, but then others we don't. Uh, and then we do all of the kind of on the job training. That's that's good to know because I, I, I always say this on every single interview almost that I know all of these people that have a bachelor's degree in science and they don't know what they can do with it. Right. And this mm -hmm. is just another example of a cool kind of job that you could get working in a lab with with that kind of degree. So thanks for sharing that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so can you give us an example of some of the type of specimens and necropsies that you do at work on a day to day basis? You don't have to give us your craziest case or anything like that, but just more of a, of an example of, of the c types of things that come across your desk every day. Sure. And this can vary greatly, uh, depending on the time of year, but, uh, I was actually just on a uh, necropsy service yesterday. So I'll just give you an example of what we saw yesterday. Uh, we had two cats, um, two, no, three, three dogs and, uh, a rooster, all in the same day. So, uh, but you know, other days we might get, um, a horse, a, a cow, uh, we do get exotics, uh, or zoo species. So we might get a pet parrot, a couple chickens. Uh, we usually see anywhere from five to 10 cases per day, uh, in necropsy. So, uh, I, I looked this up cause I couldn't remember exactly. Uh, but I think we see around 75% dogs and cats in our lab and then um, horses and then sheep sheep and goats some cows and then all the rest uh, so by far we're seeing mostly dogs and cats at our lab but that can definitely vary on the part of the country that you're in or if you're in a more rural rural area where you see a lot more livestock uh, pigs and and that type of animal so that's necropsy our uh surgical biopsy service is really busy at, at um, Colorado State. So we get around uh, you know 90 to 120 cases a day. Uh, that, God. That, that, that is a lot. That's a lot of surgical cases, actually. It is. Yep. So and that's just not all from our hospital. So we get a lot from the rest of the state and other states. We get cases sent to us from Japan even. Uh, so we just have a pretty busy lab. So we have um, four to five pathologists on surgical, uh, scheduled every day to take cases. And then, uh, we have one pathologist with residents on, uh, on our necropsy service. This is really mind blowing to me, honestly, you're like, <laughs> busier than, than a hospital, some hospitals that I've worked at actually, which is insane. I, it makes sense. So, so you're seeing specimens, Let's say, for example, you take your dog to the vet and they have a tumor and they say they want to take a biopsy of it so you can figure out if it's benign or malignant. Like that would be something that you would get. Yep. And yep. what what would drive a an, an necropsy for, for an animal? Because, for example, like one of my best friend's dogs just died a, about a month ago and she she was she's a PA actually, too. So mm. she's very curious as to what right. happened because she came home. And the belly, the baby, or the baby, the the dogs, 
her baby. Uh, the the belly was distended, and then they said that she mm-hmm. might have had a spleen tumor that ruptured, and it looked like it was filled with blood on imaging. But she would have had to pay for the autopsy, so she kind of was like, oh, "What's yeah. the difference? I don't need to get it." But is that normally what drives these cases? Is the the family wanting to know, or do you do it for scientific purposes? Uh, both. Uh, so I'd say cases that we get from uh, from outside submission. So at our lab, and I think most labs are like this, uh, owners or the pet owners are allowed to submit necropsy. So we don't have to have a, a referral. Um, so they can just bring their pet straight from home to our lab. Uh, so I think uh, that's probably the majority of cases that we get. And usually it's it's that same scenario where their pet seemed healthy one day and then the next died suddenly and uh, they really want that closure to, to get an answer. Um, and then other, otherwise it's for scientific interest or interest from our, our, uh, our clinicians in, in the hospital. So uh, why did this dog that was doing so well on this treatment suddenly go downhill so fast and die? Um, to determine extent of disease. So uh, metastasis, or they suspect that there's metastasis from a malignant tumor, and they want to know what organ it went to uh, and how how bad it was. We do have clinical trials patients that we do necropsies on that are uh, purely for research to see how the therapy was working. Uh, and then um, a lot of times there's concerns for infectious disease, especially in our large animals. So a herd health issue, um, people have chickens in their flock dying. They want to make sure that the rest of them are okay or figure out a uh, disease process to, to treat other animals in the herd or flock. So it can be for a million different reasons, but I think pet owners often just want that closure and, and get an answer. Since you work at a teaching facility, do you try to, because I've worked at a teaching re- facility for humans, do you try to kind of recruit the, the necropsies just so your students could have exposure to something that they might not ever see again in their career? We do, um, especially from the teaching hospital. So uh, we encourage them to, to submit um, interesting cases or things that we might not see. Uh, it's, it's fortunate. So in, in our, at Colorado State, uh, we do necropsies of um, patients uh, through our hospital at no charge to the client. So we use a fund of money that comes from veterinary student tuition to pay for that. Uh, so if they're a patient that's been seen in the last you know, six months to a year even and they die, then uh, we'll do that at no charge to the pet owner. So we uh, have a pretty high caseload because of that. Uh, but outside some measure submitters that are not patients of the hospital do have to pay. Uh, but we've, you know, at least since I've started, I've been here almost five years and we've never had, you know, a problem with having enough cases to teach students. And um, we've had the opposite problem where we have too many cases <laughs> for the students to handle in one day. So uh, I know that's different depending on uh, what veterinary school you're, you're working at, uh, they may have very few cases and are recruiting a lot more actively. We used to accept donations, um, but we don't anymore uh, just because we have such a high caseload. This is so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when when I do an autopsy on a person, the, the permission form is, is very important as far as really? what we're allowed to cut and who gives the permission. There's a legal next of kin who's yeah. the only one that's allowed to sign it. It, it just it gets very complicated sometimes. Because, for example, a husband would be the the legal next of kin, but maybe one of the children really don't want the autopsy done, but we would still do mm-hmm. it if, if the mm-hmm. husband wanted it done, right? So are, are there any kind of, like, who who gives permission? The owner, do they have to give permission? Yes. Yeah, so we need permission. So we have them sign a form um, that giving us permission to do the necropsy. And that uh, we're really careful about only releasing information to that person. So we need it uh, written permission if they want, um, you know, their veterinarian to see the report or talk to the pathologist. Uh, so that happens a lot where um, 
one owner will submit and then maybe the husband will try to call to get information, but we're not able to release that. And then uh, our cases from the hospital were a little bit more, since those are often being used for research as well, or for clinical trials, we have a little bit more uh, in-depth form that they fill out where they give permission for uh, tissues to be collected for research, or they can approve for the whole animal to be used for teaching our research. Uh, And this, because we often have requests from teachers uh, throughout Colorado State for maybe a whole limb or or a head of, of an animal to practice dentistry or to practice dissection on. And we wouldn't want to do that without you know written and signed consent of, of the owner of that animal. So we do have a little box that they can check where they're aware that we may use um, this entire dog for a, for a dissection purpose for teaching. Uh, so that's kind of nice that we're able to to give the owners that ability. Um, but otherwise we, we can use them signing. We can use tissues that we normally collect for our necropsy that we might do histopathology on. Uh, we can use that as part of, part of a, a study if we want. That's, that's so cool. Yeah. This is just like really <laughs> mind blowing because I never really thought about it. Yeah. And I just, I actually just wrote about a case in the gross room about animal forensics which we'll get to in a few minutes but i never really i just really never thought that this was all going on behind the scenes for animals as well when when i took biology in in my undergrad we dissected a variety of animals but they all came from like carolina scientific or whatever and they they were embalmed and just smelled terrible it's (laughs) that smell is just so terrible so you're saying that your students have a, a big range of, fra- of fresh animals to dissect, or do they do them on fixed specimens too? Um, they both. Uh, so in their first year, they dissect uh, partially fixed dogs uh, that that we do that don't come in through necropsy. So they similar. They purchase them from companies, or we have some agreements with some of the local humane societies where uh, if strays are euthanized, they can be donated. Uh, so they do have a full semester dissection class on dogs um, where small groups of veterinary students uh, will um, dissect um, fixed animals uh, and to identify all the muscle groups, nerves, arteries, and all of that. But then they, throughout their education, they have smaller group sessions where they'll practice um uh, surgical skills and joint injections on uh, fresh tissues. So that's usually where uh, we can, they can utilize our necropsy lab for uh, donated animals that way. Yeah. I mean, it's way better to look at it fresh than, than it's different. (laughs) So I always prefer that too. Yeah. Yeah. Our uh, students is uh, in their, you know, their last clinical year. That's where they have to learn how to necropsy, but they often enjoy that rotation just to kind of review anatomies that they haven't thought about since um, their first year and see it fresh compared to fixed. So it's nice that we can let them do that. What's mind blowing about the field of veterinary medicine to me is for, for example, for humans, it's, we have to learn one species of a mammal. And then you guys have to know every single other animal in the entire (laughs) animal kingdom. It's just and and I know because from biology, we dissected things all the way from like an earthworm to a, a lobster or something and a fetal pig and a frog. It's completely different anatomy in all these animals. How do you guys learn all that? It's challenging. Um, you know, we often say that's why veterinary medicine is is more exciting than human medicine just because we get to or we we are able to learn all these different uh different anatomies of all the different species. So like I said, we, in our anatomy course, they do focus on dogs, which dogs and cats are really similar. And then uh, kind of teach in different ways, the anatomical differences between species. Uh, And then, so focusing on, for example, the ruminant or cow uh, gastrointestinal system, which is, is really different compared to our carnivores, uh, where they have the four compartments in their stomach, and then horses have a really different uh, GI system as well. So different 
uh, depending on what they eat, it can really vary. Uh, so we usually try to just focus on the main differences. Uh, and then, you know, muscles are all named the same, uh, nerve groups and arteries, veins named the same. So that makes it a little bit easier. It this can be is- a challenge though. We're, I'm Googling a lot. So. <laughs> yeah. Cause you learn it once, maybe five years yeah. ago. And then <laughs> right. I, I totally understand that. I mean, that's yeah. normal. Every single person yeah. does that. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of doing a necropsy on a horse. Just, yeah. <laughs> just how difficult that would, that would be. Do you, do you have specialized morgues for these larger animals, I suppose? Yeah, we have. Our lab is pretty big. Um, we have a really advanced uh, Cree system uh, that goes through the whole lab. So we can lift horses off the ground uh, and move them around with the Cree system, which is pretty shocking when people haven't seen that before. A whole horse kind of floating through the air in our crane rail. Um, so we have really large hydraulic tables that, uh, fit a horse or a cow, or we'll put them actually like, directly on the floor too. So it's a, quite different, uh, I think, than, than human autopsies where, uh, you know, we, if we have 10 cases going at once, they can all sit, uh, in our necropsy lab. Uh, so, um, we're we definitely have some more equipment that you probably wouldn't use in an autopsy. So like a sawzall. <laughs> Um, for horse you'd limbs. Be surpri- you'd be surprised. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, I'm so, sure I would. <laughs> so how, yeah, because I'm wondering, like, how do you, how do you even lay a horse down in the way that you would need to access their, their chest and abdominal cavity? Because they don't really, I guess they have a semi-flat back. What do you have their head hang off the edge or something or? Yeah, so a lot of, uh, and some people do it differently, and I've learned both ways, but we actually do most of our autopsy or our necropsies in lateral recumbency. So, which would be really weird in a human, right? But yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, we'll only have to take off one side of the rib cage of a horse uh, to, to access lungs and heart. Um, and we'll take out a pluck, which I think you probably do in human medicine too. So, tongue, tongue to lungs. Uh, so that makes it easier. I have seen different labs do horses and dorsal recumbency, which takes just a little bit of work to get them to kind of lay flat and not roll over. Uh, we do have like some troughs and, and uh, different tools like that. But we actually, uh, at least at my lab, we do necropsies and lateral recumbency in most species. So in dogs and cats as well. It's just a little bit quicker to just take off one, one side of the rib cage and um, just encourage the students to learn one way that they feel comfortable with and uh, during their time with us. And if they do have to uh, end up doing an necropsy on their patients in, in the clinics, which they can do, uh, then they'll remember how from what we teach them. That's cool. So do you take them, do you take all, you're saying you take all the organs all, out in one block? Or- we do. Um, we take at least uh, tongue to lungs out altogether, uh, and then uh, we take the abdominal organs out separately. Um, so we're not usually doing just one nice Y incision uh, and <laughs> putting them all nicely back in. Uh, so it's, it's it's quite different, at least from, from what I know about human autopsy. But yep, we take them all out together and then sample them Uh Separately. I imagine those blocks are heavy for you to pull out all. Oh, it's so heavy. A horse, <laughs> imagine, you know, how long a horse, horse tongue or horse neck is. And so uh, definitely a teamwork situation when we have those really large animals. Um, a few months ago, we had a, a giraffe at my lab. So we had, you know, like 20 people working on the giraffe uh, just because for time and in how heavy all the organs were. So is exciting for our were you, I was going to say, were you like so excited yeah. to go to work that day? I would have been yeah. like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fun to see species that we don't always see. So, Do you have a particular one that you're like, I need to see this before I die? <laughs> I was just talking about this the other day. Um, I'd love to see, to learn more about the anatomy of a platypus. Um, just because they have like, the venom, they have like a little venom gland and uh I, I would like to, I would like to necropsy a platypus. Yeah. <laughs> Where are they native to? Oh, gosh, I, 
I don't even I don't know. know. I, don't know I wonder if you could word. just call someone at a university <laughs> there because they're probably like, oh, we, we do them all the time. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I might be able to. Um, yeah, because they're not usually, you don't usually see them in zoos either. So because uh, we do get some animals from zoos and uh, throughout the state. So we do get a lot of different species that um, that aren't kept as pets, but I've never seen one of those. So yeah, the giraffe sounds so cool. Yeah. I would be I would be stoked to see that. Um, I saw a video of an autopsy on a whale recently oh, and yeah. just think like it's just so big and, and grand. Right. I just don't even understand how how you would even navigate that when you would have to be standing inside the body to try to remove some of the organs. It's just nuts. Yeah, I never got to help with that. Um, I'd like to. I have some colleagues that like to travel and go to Alaska and they've got to help with quite a few whale necropsies. Um, but I haven't got to do that, but it would be fun and smelly. So, <laughs> uh, I know. I, I thought yes. about that. Like, okay, you have this large animal that's dying and decomposing in a bottle body of water. It's probably the worst smell ever. Yeah. They smell terrible when they're alive, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've heard I it's pretty bad. <laughs> uh, yeah. I can't, I can't even imagine because a human that's in a body of water oh. that's dead is terrible. So I just can't, I can't sure. even yeah. wrap my brain around it. But <laughs> I always say like the science of it is so exciting that you just kind of ignore the horrible smell because you want to see something cool, you know? Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not really affected by it anymore, but our students that aren't always <laughs> down there definitely have like the Vicks under their nose. And <laughs> I love that. I love when students come in and just have no idea what they're about to walk <laughs> into. And some of them are just like, look like they're going to throw up in the corner. And you just think you better get used to this because this is what you're going to smell every day working here. Yep. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by CrimeCon. Looking for a chance to win two standard badges to CrimeCon this May in Nashville? To enter, head over to my Instagram post today, March 26, and comment why you want to go to CrimeCon. Make sure you are following me, at Mrs. Anjemi, and at CrimeCon. That's it. Winners will be selected Friday, March 29th. For any additional updates about CrimeCon, make sure to follow them at CrimeCon on Instagram and X and join their free mailing list at crimecon.com slash email. When, when, so when you get these, speci- you get a lot of specimens on animals and stuff, is there a common tumor that you, uh, most common benign tumor, most common malignant tumors that you see in animals? Oh, geez. Um, at least, so there's definitely a, a difference uh, in kind of the types of cases that we see. So in... Here we are at Colorado, we see a lot of neoplasia. So uh, we have a big animal cancer center uh, in the teaching hospital. So a lot of the cases that we do get uh, are neoplasia, but I did residency in the Southeast. So we had a lot more infectious cases um, come through um, surgical biopsy and necropsy. Um, I'd say probably, uh, I thought of this when you were talking about your your friend's dog that passed, uh, but we do see a lot of hemangiosarcoma as far as malignant cancer goes. So that's a tumor of the endothelial lining of vessels. So the, the cells that line blood vessels uh, and they're really common in the spleen. So we do get those cases really commonly where the spleen is ruptured and they have a hemal abdomen, blood in the abdomen. Um, so that's an unfortunate one. They do happen in the skin as well and can be, uh, animals can be predisposed from increased sun exposure, UV exposure. So in Colorado where it's really sunny and we're at a higher elevation, we see a lot of those in the skin. And then as far as benign, um, you know, we get a lot of hamartomas, uh, little gingival masses that are just hyperplastic, um, that are benign, just proliferations. I think that's pretty common. Um, I mentioned I really like dirt paths, so I get a lot of like allergy, itchy dog, skin biopsies um, that you know t- are technically benign but cause the pet discomfort. Can animals? So this this might be a stupid question, but I I've been very allergic to dogs my entire life. I get mm-hmm. asthma, and if they lick me, I get hives, and just right. I can't be around them. Can animals? have that towards humans is there is has that ever been documented you know it's 
I think it'd be hard to prove. Um, we do clinicians, dermatologists will do allergy testing in dogs, kind of like like we do for people where you get all the little pinpricks yeah, that's cool. on your back. Yeah, so we can do that in dogs, but it's a little bit, uh, the science is a little bit less clear than in, in humans. Um, so I'd, I haven't heard of a case where, you know, human dander, <laughs> human skin cells <laughs> came up as an allergen to dogs, but they do have pretty similar environmental allergens that people do to grasses and uh, so seasonal allergies dogs get pretty commonly. Yeah, that's, so, it, I mean, it, it, it's I, possible, it, right? Like, it is, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely possible. <laughs> I just never really thought about that. Um, when you have, so you're talking, you have an, a cancer center. Uh, what I feel like I only knew a couple people that have had cancer and had to get chemo. One being my grandmom and my, and my uncle both had biliary cancer. So they had terrible, like hardcore chemo yeah. and, I wouldn't really advise that for any human, let alone an right. animal. And I know people talk about getting their animals chemotherapy. So, and then some vet techs that are in the gross room have mentioned that it's just not as the same as a human getting it. So can you explain that to us more? Yeah. So, I mean, at least where I work, a lot of animals are getting chemotherapy, right? Since they travel here to get treatment from our oncologists. And from what I understand is often the dosages of the chemotherapeutics aren't as strong as what we give people. So they might not get as severe uh, side effects. And I mean, we do see dogs that are nauseous, a little bit inappetent, maybe some hair loss, but it's never as severe as it seems uh, that people experience. And uh, so we can treat again with like anti-nausea medications and they seem to do really well. And uh, I don't think it's, you know, as, as understood, but I think it has to do with the, the dosage of, of what chemotherapeutic they're using. We do have animals. I've seen some animals that just don't respond well or or have such severe side effects that um, that they have to discontinue. So it does happen, but not as not as commonly as in as in people. That yeah. So do you ever think maybe humans could get a little bit less and they don't know, need so I, much I or something? <laughs> and I think yeah, there's a there's a difference, right? Like we're and obviously in, in animals too, we're trying for curative intent with chemotherapy, but. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the neoplasia, or the cancer that dogs are getting, uh, maybe chemotherapy extend their life by one cancer for a year. Uh, that's like pretty hopeful um, for a lot of diseases, unfortunately. But in people, we're hoping for like remit complete remission and for life. Then, <laughs> exactly. So I think that that has a lot to do with it as well. Just kind of different different therapeutic goals, I guess, um, for for dogs versus people. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. So talk talking about my same friend, hopefully she listens to this. I'll tell her to anyway. Yeah. Which so she has dogs that she gets from a breeder mm -hmm. and I feel like they have they have problems. I don't I don't have dogs, so I don't know if every dog just has problems, but she, she's had autoimmune disease, a couple mm -hmm. have had cancer and die at Eight, nine years old not too old but I don't I don't know again how long they're supposed to live but she so I always say to her like maybe you don't want to get the, this from the breeder because I did write an article last year in the gross room about inbreeding mm -hmm. with humans and I couldn't really get I did find a couple articles talking about it with animals but there was some conflicting information with that so I know with humans if you have children too close together, there could be an increased risk of genetic mutations and inherited genetic disease, other inherited genetic diseases. What about with animals? Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah. And, uh, and you know, what some of this has been pretty well proven with different um, breeds of dogs. And we'll just use dogs as an example since that's the most common. But uh, certain diseases, yes, it, it's been proven. We've found the genetic mutation in certain breeds that predispose to different cancers and different conditions. And other times we haven't been able to find that, that genetic, but it seems like there is a predisposition, uh, a higher percentage of, you know, say golden retrievers get osteosarcoma and mangiosarcoma, 
Uh, these are all just examples. Bernie's mountain dogs get histiocytic diseases, histiocytic sarcoma. Um, most of them get get this some some sort of histiocytic neoplasm during their life. Um, so I think it's it's proven that that certain purebred dogs are predisposed to certain diseases. Um, but that being said, because uh, I get this question all the time, like. Well, I got a I got a mutt from the pound, and it still got bone cancer. And like, why did that happen? Now it, it, there's still spontaneous point mutations that are you know predisposed to to neoplasia. Um, so I think we just don't know as much in dogs as we do in people about about genetic predispositions or genetic mutations, but we're getting there slowly um, through research and identifying these genes. Uh, so, you know, I have all mixed breed dogs, um, partly for that reason, but, uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't stop, doesn't stop folks that, that love a certain breed from continuing to, to get them. So I think it's important to, you know, look into what breeder you're buying dogs from and seeing if they're on top of research, because there are a lot of, uh, tests that you can do to test for genetic mutations in breeds that we know about uh, to kind of and stop breeding those individuals. Uh, so I think if you're going to buy purebred dogs, uh, make sure you're buying from responsible breeders and not just, you know, hobby backyard people. That just made me say, think of something too, yeah. when you were saying that people were saying that their mutts were coming up with bone cancer or something yeah. too. I I mean, I, I'm assuming that animals have the, can have the same environmental exposures to what? viruses and even, I mean, what I, I've never thought about this either, but what about a dog living in a house with, with a chronic smoker or something like that? Has there any been studies done on that kind of stuff? There has been. It's, dif again, d pretty difficult to prove, uh, but, you know, we... Uh, I get that question all the time too. Like, I lived near a factory. Is this why my dog died? Uh, maybe, right? We can't really uh, say one way or the other. Um, they've done big studies on squamous cell carcinomas and cats that thought maybe like cats that were in smoking households were more likely to get carcinoma. But uh, it's it's just it's hard to hard to prove and. Uh, think about, you know, an animal that has such a shortened lifespan compared to a person. So their environmental exposures can have a, a greater impact in their lifetime, uh, or at least that's kind of what we think. And, you know, it's, it's easier to study cancers in dogs because they have a shorter lifespan um, compared to a person, right? So, um, for example, I'm going back to the purebred dogs, we're uh, part of... Uh, a golden retriever lifetime study from the Morris Animal Foundation. So they've followed around 2,000 dog golden retrievers from time they're puppy to death, and they uh, get regular veterinary care, and they'll all, or as many as we can, get necropsies at the end of their life to try to get a little bit more information on what these dogs are dying from and, and do some more genetic research. So I think with time, when we're trying to catch up to human medicine, we'll figure more of that stuff out. Yeah, it's it's just, this is just so cool. It, I, I really appreciate this interview with you because I'm learning so much stuff today. Um, So there's, we're going to start talking about now how your work could also help humans. Um, There's infectious diseases, for, for those of you who don't know that are listening, that some can are specific to species like feline HIV or HIV and felines or um, feline immunodeficiency virus is only something that happens in felines and human immunodeficiency virus is only something that happens in humans. So a human that has that just can't give it to a cat. But there are ones that are called zoonotic diseases, which cross species and I know that most people could say that they've heard of that because of when they were stalk talking about the origin of COVID, when they were trying to determine if it was coming from one of those wet markets and that they were saying that it crossed species from an animal to a human. So in those types of cases, someone like you would get involved in that in that kind of stuff. Is Have you ever been involved in a case where you were doing a necropsy on an animal to try to see if it was from if it was spreading to humans or vice versa? 
Yeah, we we get zoonotic uh, cases pretty frequently. The biggest example is rabies. Uh, so our lab uh, removes brains, and then the virology lab upstairs will do the fluorescent antibody test uh, to determine if an animal had rabies or not. So I think that's probably the best example where we get. My tech texted me the other day, and we had we got fifteen cases in one day um, where a brain brains needed to re- be removed from wildlife and dogs. Uh, so we get uh, mostly the dog cases are from bite bite cases where the dogs weren't vaccinated uh, against rabies, and then they bit someone, and uh, so they were euthanized and had to have their brain removed for uh, to test for rabies to make sure the person wasn't exposed. Uh, so we get those all the time. Um, we do get some positives, uh, but by that time, hopefully the person has had post-exposure uh, vaccinations. Um, I haven't had one where, uh, since like if we're using rabies as an example, it's so rare for humans in the U.S. to, to succumb to rabies or to get disease from it. Um, so I haven't had to go backwards in that way, uh, but we do a lot of zoonotic testing in our lab. So we get uh, wildlife and even dogs and cats where um, plague is suspected or tularemia. Uh, those are big examples that are common in Colorado. Uh, we've had a couple of anthrax cases. Uh, we had one um, two years ago in the lab, which is scary. Luckily we have our a separate kind of area for um, zoonotic diseases. So only one person was around the cow that had it to do the testing. Um, but that's a big deal uh, that we have to you know, inform the, the government about uh, <laughs> reportable diseases. Um, yeah, so we, we do that a lot. Uh, what usually happens if an animal has plague, and especially a dog, this happens every couple of years where it was treated in, in the hospital. So vet students and nurses and Doctors were all exposed to this dog, and then oh gosh, what a mess! Yeah, so, um, so that's usually where kind of uh, at least they don't have the disease, but they were exposed. So we want to make sure um, people are aware of that. Uh, we get chlamydia cases that are zoonotic. Uh, so we have you know a biosecurity hood that we do all our pet birds in. Um, and uh, certain abortion cases, uh, so for Q fever and chlamydia. So we're exposed to quite a few different zoonotic uh, things on the necropsy floor. <laughs> we were, so I, I don't know if you listened to my interview that I did with Dr. Michelle Miranda. She's a forensic tattoo expert, and she Ooh, was... Yes, I did listen to that one. Yeah, yeah did you... So... T- just briefly, like she was talking about, she had just be- been at a conference in Australia and found out that koalas carried chlamydia. Yeah, yeah, they it, do. Yeah. That, <laughs> it, is that something that is considered zoonotic? Like, could it get spread to humans oh, or it's a different kind of I think that species? one's different. Um, it's chlamydia pecorum, I think. Um, and I can't remember if humans can get that one, but the ones that birds get is um, cytosai, so chlamydia cytosai, so our cytosine parrots, so parrots, like cockatiels, all of them, and we can get that chlamydia, so. Oh, God. But, yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, you know, that's a reason why we do all those cases in the biosecurity hood, even if we're, you know, pretty sure that's not what it is, just in case. <laughs> So since we're working with students a lot, you don't want that uh oh moment of you know opening up an animal and and seeing that it's probably something zoonotic. <laughs> yeah, we had one time I used to work at a a hospital that did a lot of neuropathology, and we had a case mm-hmm. of suspected rabies, and they wanted yeah. us to do the autopsy in our lab. And I remember the neuropathologist came up to me, and he was like, "I I just don't want you doing that case," yeah. and I was like, mm-hmm. "Okay." <laughs> He's just like, you don't want to be exposed to that. I, I don't know what the precautions are here. Just it would be better if you're not exposed to it. So do you do you guys have to do special precautions for for suspected cases of rabies or is that just normal universal precautions? We're actually all vaccinated. Um, so all of that students and anyone that works in our lab is uh, that's going to be around brain tissues vaccinated against rabies. And then we do titers uh, that our work pays for uh, every other year to just make sure that we're good to go. Um, But we do 
we don't expose the students even though they're vaccinated. So we have a separate area that will remove brains. Uh, and then usually my technicians are doing that. So they wear cut gloves and uh, take a little bit extra precautions. Definitely not using any saws uh, around uh, re- potential rabies suspects. Uh, so, uh, but we do have, you know, N95s and we get fit tested and uh, we try to be as careful as we can with those cases. Is is it ma- it's mandatory then that you guys get vaccinated for that? Because I would I would yeah. think it should be. <laughs> it but is, we, yeah, yeah. Unless you know, you we're not for humans. That's medical, right, right. So if we had a, a medical reason, I've had a couple of vet students that got really had really severe reactions. It's a three vaccine series, so maybe mm-hmm. they end up only getting two and then getting titers more regularly. Uh, but otherwise, we're all required to do that and do the by or every other year tighter. Yeah, because the it's it's not like, oh, I'll take my chances. Like no. <laughs> you're pr- you're going to die if you get that. No. So I would definitely exactly. <laughs> Yeah. So all veterinarians are vaccinated just because they they're gonna get they're probably at uh maybe a higher risk just because they can get bit. <laughs> yeah, <their> right. <laughs> chefs, but <laughs> oh God, that's scary. All right, let's talk about the forensic aspect of this. I don't know how familiar you are with it, but in the gross room last week or two weeks ago, I wrote about a case of a dog. So the scene investigators show up to the scene of a murder where a man was shot and also his dog was shot to death. They were both shot to death. And they said that one of the one of the the man went to the medical examiner to get an autopsy, but then the dog had a necropsy done to retrieve a, a bullet. So that got me really thinking about talking to someone like you because this is this is really interesting. Obviously, the body of the human will go to the medical examiner's office. Would the body of the dog go to someone like you? Yes. Uh, yep. We get uh, forensic or legal necropsy cases all the time. We had uh, two. I had, I had, I had two yesterday. Uh, so we get cases submitted from all different counties of law enforcement agencies or humane societies throughout Colorado. Uh, and then we also, I mentioned that pet owners can submit so they can, you know, choose to to submit their own animal for a forensic necropsy and with plans to, you know, prosecute or try to try to prosecute whoever they think might have killed their animal or um, uh, so we do get cases like that, too. That's that's really interesting. So when you learned this in school, you learned this in your in your um, residency thing that you were doing afterwards. So during that, were you trained specifically in forensics, how to handle evidence and how to take pictures? Because ultimately, these ca- that information could be used in the prosecution with the case, probably, I'm assuming. Yep. yep. So we handle them a little bit differently. Uh, and I've uh, you know, I have a an interest in forensics. So I've, I definitely seek out additional uh, continuing education or training uh, at our different pathology meetings. There's often different lectures or, or workshops that we can do about forensics. Um, so we do take photos differently than we do of our other cases uh, with labels and, and not deleting photos that we take, uh, making sure we're documenting every single part, which we don't always do with our, our diagnostic kind of regular cases, and then collecting evidence a different way. We store tissues for for much longer than we do our normal cases for years uh, and collect them in a little bit different way um, for, our, for our forensic cases. Uh, but I know training can vary quite a bit uh, amongst training programs. Um, one thing that I, I try to expose our residents to these cases because we uh, we make sure that the residents don't take kind of primary responsibility for legal cases because we don't want them to to get subpoenaed and have to go to court for it. They may have moved away or be busy with studying or some things. So we don't want them to have to deal with it. But I think that kind of does a disservice for our residents because uh, then when they start a job and they're all of a sudden like, okay, here you go. Now you're the responsible party. So I try to at least you know, talk to them about the cases that I take and and make sure they're aware of the process just so that it's not a surprise when they're done with residency. 
Yeah, that makes sense because, yeah, they'll they'll be getting ready to take a really important test yep. and have to go testify at court. And just exactly. that would be the last thing on their mind that they want right. to deal with at that point. So you there's been times where you will collect like bullets. Do you collect DNA and stuff like that, too? We will collect at least fresh sterile tissue, um, but... Uh, and I know, you know, other labs are a little bit better equipped to collect trace evidence um, and, you know, fingerprint the animals and, and DNA. But we do rely on our law enforcement agency to do some of that before they bring the animal to us. But I'll just try to collect as much as I can. And, uh, you know, we're not ballistics experts, so we'd still rely on the, the law enforcement um officer that were, is assigned to the case to come and pick up the bullet fragments to to do additional testing there. But uh, we're trying to collect as much as possible at the time of the exam that we might need later on. So we'll you know, keep stomach contents and additional samples, uh, fluids that we might not for a normal necropsy, but try to just anticipate anything that we might have to do later on. What are other circumstances that you would do a forensic exam on an animal? So we get the, uh, we get a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of neglect and abuse cases. Uh, so you know, hoard, hoarding cases where animal control is called out because, you know, they see their neighbor starving their dog and it died. Uh, so they want to prove that and, and, and try to prosecute the person that they think um, killed the animal from neglect or abuse. So that's probably most common. Um, and then, you know, we get it. Unfortunately, we get cases like the one that you mentioned where a person was injured at the same time. So they want to try to uh, use that to help in prosecution against um, the injury that they did towards a person or if they murdered them. Um, you know, we've had a case where a uh, person, you know, attempted to, they killed the animal, they killed the dog and then tried to kill their girlfriend at the same time. So they really want to hammer it home and uh, use that in the prosecution to make sure that person goes to prison. Um, yeah, if they, we get a lot of, you know, starvation cases, unfortunately, uh, or like abandoned buildings and they find an animal in there. Uh, so they want to see if it was killed or if it died of natural causes. Yeah, my, my husband works in Camden City. I don't know if you know anything about it, but he sees a lot of He's a firefighter and he just mm -hmm. comes across cases of different things all the time. And I, I think about all of these, there's, I guess there's special police officers, like animal control officers yes. mm -hmm. that, so you must deal with them when you're yep. dealing with this, right? Mm -hmm. And would you, or have you ever had to go to tor to court to testify on any of these types of cases? So, so far I haven't gone to court, um, but I do get subpoenaed like multiple times a year and, you know, I've gotten to where the trial was the next week uh, and that, but then the person pled guilty. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm almost had to go to trial multiple times. Um, I have kind of an active case right now that they think is going to go to trial later in the summer. Uh, but my colleagues have, um, multiple times some of them so over their careers so we do get called as expert witnesses for these cases uh, a lot of times they're able to just use our report to prosecute uh, but other times they they really feel like it would be important for us to to go to trial so we do get called a lot so i may go to trial later this year but often like as soon as they put us in as expert witnesses i feel like they kind of do a plea deal or at least that's been my experience but um yeah, at least like three or four of my of the other pathologists I work with have had to go multiple times for different cases. Yeah, that that would make me so nervous. I, I mean, I guess I don't know, because I feel like when I do autopsy and stuff, I'm very confident in what I find. And I think I would be I would be fine. I just yeah. I've been to court a couple times with the medical examiner and the defense lawyers are just so like yeah. scummy and ask th these <laughs> stupid questions. And I would, I don't know how I would, I wouldn't be, able, I would be like a smart ass to them maybe. <laughs> yeah. I, um, one of the cases I, you know, when I first started, I, I wasn't really sure how the process worked and I didn't know that you could say no to the, the defense about meeting beforehand. So they wanted to, 
to meet before the trial and it was a video chat and it was an hour long interrogation <laughs> from them like how can you say this like what if this was your animal and how old do you think this dog should have lived? And just oh a my lot. god, it was a lot. So I was happy that that one didn't go all the way because it did give me a taste of what it could could be like. Uh, but yeah, I think you know whatever case we're doing, we should have confidence in what we put out in our report. So as long as we can stick to that, but um, you know they do they do want us to give our opinions as well, like not based on our findings, which I really try to avoid. Uh, you know, just like, I can only tell you what I see in my exam. Uh, and they have a lot more information about the case than we do to kind of make those inferences. And it's up to the, the officers and the prosecution to put the story together. So, Yeah. And isn't it like the, the court might be a whole year or later after you yeah. actually did the case? So you're like, I don't exactly. I don't remember. Look, read my report. This is what I saw. Yeah, they they'll email me and say, hey, you're going to get a subpoena from and they just give you the animal's name, maybe or like, I'm like, I have no idea what case that is. I'm going to need a date range or something. Right. You're like, I've done 50 this week. Like, what do you (laughs) what do you want from me here? All right. Well, do you have anything else that that you want to talk about that I didn't cover? Um, I just say, you know, for anyone that that Mm -hmm. is thinking about. You know, going into veterinary medicine, just keep all your options open. Uh, you can do a lot with this degree or even any science degree, like you mentioned. Uh, you know, look what's out there. There's a lot of careers that you might not have heard of. Um, like most people that I tell what my job is, they've never, they don't know what pathology is or didn't know that there are veterinary pathologists doing necropsy. So just uh, do your research and keep keep your options open uh, for what you want to end up doing. I love that. This is this is so interesting. And I think what I gather from this whole interview is that your job is so cool. And at any level, if you just if you want to be a tech. So I guess if you went to there's like a degree for associates degree for vet tech, right? It's associates. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, or if you want to go the full route and do the whole doctor, if you want to be a doctor too, there's a different, there's lots of different education levels that you could do this job. And on top of that, it's cool. Cause I feel like in human medicine, you have to pick like, okay, do you want to do hospital pathology or forensic pathology? And with yours, it's like, you can kind of do everything and see lots more. Honestly, sounds really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's the best job ever. So <laughs> you, you've yeah. definitely sold me. I'm yeah. very interested <laughs> in it. Thank you. Well, well, thanks for being here with us today. It was so nice meeting you. Nice meeting you too. Thanks.